We introduced depth first search in the last screencast. Now we'll look at an example of its operation, which will lead to some properties that are important for its applications. So let's launch towards Mokumanamana. This is our second visit to Mokumanamana on the 2005 education voyage. Then Congressman Ed Case had flown into Turn Island in the French Frigate Shoals and joined us for this second half. He was designated my snorkeling buddy. And let me tell you, that guy can hold his breath. And so can Alan Nakagawa, the teacher in the background. We'll work with this example graph, and we're going to put the discovery time on the left, the finish time on the right. Uh, we'll color by drawing a circle around things, and um, we're going to just use the, the parent pointer. We'll just be, we'll draw in the uh, parent pointers. So we'll consider this graph to be already initialized. Uh, we're going to set time is to be zero. And for each vertex in the graph, uh, it, if the color is white, we're going to DFS visit it. So we'll start with this vertex here that's got the, uh, the D and the F arrows to it. And now we're going to call DFS visit. So here's the pseudocode DFS visit. We're calling it on this vertex up here. And we increment time. And we set the discovery time of this vertex to that time. And we color it gray. But since gray doesn't show up very well, I'm going to use this turquoise instead. So that indicates that this one is discovered. <clears throat> okay, so for each vertex adjacent to it, I'm not sure what order to do it in here. I guess I'll just go around the circle here. If the color is white, mark it to be the parent and visit. So let's put in a purple parent pointer. And now we're going to call on this vertex here. We're visiting this vertex here, DFS visit. So we re-enter the um, DFS visit, and we increment time will be 2, and we mark the discovery time to be 2, and the color is our simulated gray, which is really turquoise. And uh, then we go for its adjacent vertices, uh, see if their colors are white. Here's one here. Set the parent, purple parent pointer and call DFS visit. So we've recursed. Uh, so now we're recursing on this node. Time is uh, three. Color this one. Record uh, the time. I'm not doing it. The, the order of these three statements. You've got to increment the time before you save it. But the other order, the other two doesn't matter. So there's three. And again, we look for its adjacent vertices. And uh, that's going to be, we're going to head down this one here. And so we install, since um, this node here is U, we set, or sorry, this node here is V, this is U at the moment. We set V's parent to U, and we recurse. So we, now we've just entered the recursion again for this node, and so increment again. Make this one gray, and give it the current time, which is four, and continue. Maybe I'll just do it without talking it through here. Okay, so that's another recursive call. I should put in the parent pointer. Then we get another recursive call out of this one, parent pointer, which of course is going to end up with the incrementing and the coloring gray. Uh, okay, where are we? Well, we've just, we, we were going through this one for each V adjacent to U. This is currently U. We hit this V here. It's not white. Actually, that would happen twice. We've got two adjacent vertices, this one and this one. But both of them are not white. They're gray. So we skip out of that loop, and this is U. We're going to color U's color black. And we're going to increment time again. And we're going to, I guess it doesn't matter what color it is. We're going to say finish time is 7. Now notice here we bottomed out in our recursion, and so we get finish time uh, adjacent integers. That's where you recognize that the recursion has bottomed out. We return from that call. Now we're back here where u is this node up here and we check its adjacent vertices. We had already done that one. These other two are also not white. That test fails. So it drops out and it says color it black, increment the time, and give it the finish, give it that finish time. Similar here, okay, let's see. We return from the recursive call. 
all there's no other adjacent vertices so we drop out of that for loop color it black increment the time and mark the time return from this recursive call this has no other adjacent vertices drop out of the loop color it black increment the time and uh, put the time in there now we return from that recursive call and the uh, same thing black finally we return from this recursive call here we're back in our original call to the original vertex and uh, are there any other more adjacent vertices no same thing here color it black increment time but what's going on here we promised that we would visit all the vertices but we haven't gotten to those two there well this says for each vertex u and gv this is how we got into the first call up here its color was white so we visited it but now we're going to iterate over all the other vertices in the graph and i don't know what order the vertices are listed in the graph you know whatever order they come out it might check some of these others first and they'll say not white not white not white but eventually it's going to see that one right so eventually it's going to make another recursive call and DFS visit on one of these other ones. Let's say it's this one. So let's go back to the call on DFS visit. And it's going to uh, increment time and mark it as gray. And then it's going to look for its neighbors. It finds one. It will increment time, color it gray. And it will check for its neighbors. Its neighbor, its color is not white. It will drop down to where we color this black and increment again. And here you get again consecutive integers. That means your search is bottomed out. Uh, return. Now we're back in the call to this one. Do I have any more neighbors? Yes, but it's not white. Uh, none of them are white. Drop through, color me black, and do the time thing. And then it'll return from that call. So now we're done. So I hope you're clear on how this works. What have we accomplished? Well, first of all, I forgot to put in the parent pointers here. Uh, we got one more here. We have a forest of trees. Here's one tree. It's a linear kind of thing. There's no real branching, but you can get branching. And here's the other tree. And notice that when we started from this node here, we could get to all of these, but we could not get to this. Because all the arrows are going in the wrong direction from the second cluster we found to the first cluster. That's a clue to how this is going to be useful. This tells us something about the connectivity of the graph, what's reachable from what. We've discovered a cluster here that is not reachable from any of these nodes over here. Because if it was reachable from any of these nodes over here, we would have gotten there. And so this is a clue to how we're going to use this algorithm in another algorithm to discover strongly connected components. So the teachers with waterproof clipboards in hand go off looking for fish with their checklists. And there goes Alan. So when the DFS completes, we can classify the original edges of the tree according to how they relate to the DFS search. So we're concerning ourselves with the edges that are in the original tree, those ones that are black that were in the original graph, not the purple ones. Those are our purple parent pointers. So one classification of the edges is what we're going to call a tree edge. And those are the ones found by exploring an edge in the DFS. And we can mark those in the graph. We'll make them really fat so we can see them really well. So we started the search at this node here. And we follow this edge and this edge. This is just going backwards over the parent pointers, of course. And then we follow this edge over here. So those fat black ones are the tree edges. And the um, resulting graph, everything shown in black, other than the skinny stuff that I didn't outline, are the two trees found by the depth first search. The next classification we'll have here is a back edge. And these are the edges that are reverse, VU, where V is a descendant of U. An example of a back edge in here 
would be this one right here. V u or v is a descendant of u and descendant in terms of the tree edges. That's why we did them first. The tree edges in the tree. Here's another back edge. And actually here is another back edge. The next classification will be forward edges. This is where we have u v. u is a descendant of u but not a tree edge. Under some other ordering of the neighbors, this could have been a tree edge. So an example of that here would be this one. And by the way, I missed another back edge right here. But we've got some edges left here that haven't been dealt with. What are they going to be? These will be cross edges. And they're all others. So these here are cross edges. And you can see that they cross the tree. They don't go between descendants and ans you know, ancestors and descendants. They just cross from one tree to another. They can cross actually within a tree, but they would have to cross between two vertices that are not related to each other by the descendant relation. And I don't think we have an example of that here because you'd have to have branching for that to take place. That would be the case where the descendants went like this and then the um, cross edge would be that one, using the colors properly. Not being a very good diver, I headed off to the surface zone to see what was in there. And I found this stealth jellyfish. To wrap up, we have three theorems here about depth for search. And to show these theorems, I'm going, switching to the textbook's example because we need this branching structure in order to illustrate one of the cases here. So the parentheses theorem, the first one we'll look at, is essentially it's saying that the discovery and finish times are well nested. Or another way of putting it is that you're never going to have this kind of overlap between the intervals of discovery and finishing for two vertices. It's either going to be, as expressed here, disjoint, or these two cases say one is nested inside the other. And we see that in the illustration here. This search has started at 10, and using our prior color conventions, of course, the tree arrows are these. These are the ones that were explored. There's the branching structure, and then it had to restart from this node to get everything. And that gave us these, these discovery and finish times. And one of three cases is going to hold. Either they are entirely disjoint. And by the way, we always know that UD is less than U of F by nature of the algorithm. So here's the example where they're disjoint. And neither is it, that means neither is a descendant of the other in the forest, which is true. These are two distinct trees, just like we had in the last example. Or the other two cases is basically one is contained inside the other. These are just symmetric. The u is contained inside the v, or the v is contained inside the u, and the one that's contained is a descendant, which makes sense. You know, if you're going to see, you're going to see z, node z before you're going to see node y or node w, and so you visited z before you first discovered y or w, and you finished z after you finished y or w, and so that's why both of these respect these conditions here that the times for y and w are nested within z. So that's the gist of the parentheses theorem. There's a somewhat detailed proof in the book. An immediate corollary of that um, parentheses theorem is this nesting of descendants intervals. That a vertex is a proper descendant of another vertex only if their time intervals are nested. The time interval of use discovery and use finishing has to wrap around the time interval of V's discovery and V's finishing. The white path theorem says that vertex V is a descendant of vertex U if and only if at the time of the discovery of U of D there's a path from U to V consisting only of white vertices except for U which was just colored gray. So I've got U gray here. I'm using yellow for white since white wouldn't show up. And so this is saying this is holds in both directions. So looking at it in one direction if there's a path from U to V consisting of only white vertices when u is discovered, 
then we can see from the algorithm that each of these vertices are going to recursively be explored until you eventually visit all the reachable vertices before you leave this vertex U. And on the other hand, if vertex V was discovered as a descendant of U, then there must have been some, at the time that U was discovered, this must have been a white path. Because if it wasn't a white path, that would have meant that some other vertex, the search from some other vertex, had gone in here and captured part of that path. And it would have gone off and done whatever it did. This edge here would never have been explored because by the time V looked at that node there, it would no longer be white. You know, this algorithm here says we only explore if it's white. So that's a pretty informal sketchy proof. You can see a formal proof in the book of that one. And then finally, there's the DFS theorem, which is, says that the um, undirected, DFS of an undirected graph only produces tree and back edges, never forward or cross edges. In an undirected graph, the edges are bidirectional, essentially. So well, what would be a forward edge in the directed case would have just been explored in one of the two directions in the undirected case. And what would have been a cross edge in the directed case where you've got another tree here and maybe you never got there because you had that directed thing here and you couldn't get there from here would have been explored in the undirected case because there's no arrow there and you would have gotten over there. So that concludes our exploration of an example and properties of depth first search and our snorkeling around Mokomanomanu until tomorrow. And we have an evening class on the deck of the Hialakai.